Okay, so the villains of Home Chem. <laughs> so you open your window, and in comes outdoor air. Outdoor air. And and maybe you live in a city, and there's a bit of ozone there. Mm -hmm. So ozone comes in for the windows, and then it starts to react. At ground level, ozone is something we consider bad. If we're talking about the ozone layer, if we're talking about the stratosphere, we like ozone up there. It filters out the UV. It reduces the probability that someone might develop cancer because of exposure to ultraviolet light from the sun. But at ground level, ozone's a reactive molecule. So you mop the floor with a with a cleaner, maybe it smells a bit like a pine forest. So now you have all these chemicals called monoterpenes. They're all in the Coming air. up in the air. And so ozone comes in and it just starts eating away at your nice pine forest scent. It will do one of a couple things. It's gonna attack the molecule and leave an oxygen atom on that molecule. And now you no longer have that beautiful alpha pinene chemical that was making it smell like your last hike to the forest, right? So it starts eating away. It adds that oxygen atom. Maybe it goes in it. It reacts with some of the other molecules, makes a whole series of other chemicals that no longer look like they first did. And those new chemicals that you have now just created in your home, they no longer want to hang out in, in the, the air. air. They want to go and find the nearest particle or surface, and they're going to all schlock together and make a particle. Mm -hmm. That's called secondary organic aerosol. Any compound that has a carbon-carbon double bond at the very end will react with ozone to make formaldehyde. Now, I don't know how many of the people who are listening to this recognize, you know, remember their chemistry to think about a carbon-carbon double bond at the end of the molecule, but it's not very complicated chemistry. You, you know, you draw these, these carbons connected to carbons connected to carbons, and all I'm saying is at the very end, when that carbon is connected to carbon, if there's two lines rather than one, you're going to get formaldehyde when ozone reacts with it. Ozone reacts with some of these scented products. We were talking about limonene a moment ago. Ozone will react with limonene to make not just formaldehyde, but also particles. And particles aren't good for us. And the higher the particle concentrations, the greater the adverse effects. So we worry not just about ozone itself. We worry about the products of ozone-initiated chemistry. I got a call one day, the guitar player in a very well-known rock and roll band uh, coming out of Detroit. He had had a dispute with one of his neighbors. The neighbor hired somebody to spray skunk oil into the individual who called me's car and house and property. This person spoke with his insurance company. The insurance company said, call this company. They'll come in and make the smell go away. Well, the company that came into his home set up, I believe, six commercial size ozone generators, set them up in his house, switched them all on full blast, and forgot to tell the family they shouldn't be in the house when these things were switched on. A three-year-old daughter, a dog, um, a wife, and himself all became sick. You should never be present when there's an ozone generator of any kind on. Right? You should probably never purchase an ozone generator for personal use in your house. They rarely do what they're supposed to do or what they claim to do. To make a long story short, I was called in to do a forensics analysis to figure out what the family was actually exposed to. So I got all the specifications on these commercial grade uh, ozone generators. I visited the home, I took measurements in the home, I looked at all the materials in the home so I could figure out how much ozone would actually react with the materials which takes it out of the air. And I back calculated that the family was probably exposed to about a quarter to one half of what's called the IDLH, which stands for immediately dangerous to life and health, close to levels that could, could kill them. Right? It also harmed a lot of works of art. It degraded a lot of rubber in the house, rubber gaskets. They had leaky water heaters because of ozone reacting with, with rubber. It was this horrible but great in some ways example of what ozone can do to an indoor environment. When you're in an airport and you've gotten off the plane and you feel all grotty and grimy, what's actually happened is all of the skin oils on you, on your skin, have actually reacted with ozone molecules that came Inside the in airplane. the air in the airplane when you, when you fly up high. The ozone levels 
outside an aircraft can reach easily 800 ppb. If we think of Washington DC in August on an ozone alert day, it might be 100 ppb. So we're talking about roughly eight times higher outside that aircraft at 30 or 35,000 feet. The aircraft industry recognizes that you have high ozone levels outdoors. And on most double aisle planes, they take the ozone out of the ventilation air. But it costs money to take ozone out of the plane. And on the single aisle planes, if they can avoid it, they don't take the ozone out of the air. Roughly 50% of the single aisle planes don't take ozone out of the air. So during this period that we were funded by the FAA, we made ozone measurements on numerous flights. When we were on these single aisle planes that weren't taking ozone out of the cabin, we saw really high levels in some cases. We were on a flight from New York to San Francisco where we measured ozone levels inside the cabin of about 300 ppb, about three times higher than you would have on an ozone alert day in Atlanta or Washington or LA. That wasn't the average concentration for the entire flight, but it got up to that high during the flight. Those levels will drive a lot of chemistry inside the aircraft. Now, some of that chemistry, a great deal of that chemistry on the aircraft, involves ozone reacting with us, the occupants. Our skin oils, our skin oils contain compounds that react with ozone. I mean, you're packed in there like sardines, and now you introduce ozone. Those human beings, they're really important sinks for the ozone, but, but they're not just sucking the ozone out. The ozone's reacting with them making products. So you're breathing these products of ozone reacting with your fellow passengers. When you're washing your hands or you're taking a shower, you're just removing all of that chemistry that just occurred mm -hmm. on your skin in the plane or outside walking around or inside in an office. This really adds to that idea that, you know, my body is a colony of microbes. My body is also a very complex reaction chamber, not yes. only on the inside, yeah. but on the yeah. outside. So I, I, didn't, I didn't really used to think about this before, but now I think about it all the time, that my, my skin is also a surface. When I'm inside the indoor environment and we're thinking about all these walls and the ceiling and the floors being part of the chemistry of the indoor environment, yeah. my own body is also part of that chemistry. Home Chem is helping us understand the different products that are formed when you have a condition where you've got ozone and you've got people and you've got different surfaces. We know if we see it in the test house in Austin, we know we're going to see some of those same products on the aircraft. Even if we don't have $4.6 million worth of instruments on the aircraft measuring the air. It's not that hard to get rid of ozone in indoor environments. And if we're worried about ozone reaction products, those byproducts from all the ozone chemistry that happens indoors, we can just knock the ozone out. It's not that hard. We can do it with activated carbon filters. We can do it with um, mineral-based building materials like clay or perlite or limestone. React very, very effectively with ozone and produce minimal to no byproducts in the process. The great thing about these inorganic mineral-based uh, materials like clay, the alumina silicates in clay and, and also uh, chemicals in, um, in limestone and so, so on and so forth, is that they catalytically decompose the ozone. The ozone just kind of breaks apart, right? It's gone and in the process there's no removal of any reaction chemicals on the material. So they sustain their reactivity indefinitely, you know, forever.